Good morning. Uh, this is Bob Keiter, uh, director of the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment uh, at the University of Utah, SJ Quinney College of Law. And it's my pleasure uh, to welcome everyone back to uh, the 26th annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium on the Plastics Paradox, uh, Societal uh, Boon or Environmental Bane. Uh, to begin, uh, I'd like to uh, recite uh, our traditional uh, native lands acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the university's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities. I would also like uh, to acknowledge and thank again our principal funders and sponsors for their support for the symposium. Our principal funding uh, comes from the R. Harold Burton Foundation, which is actually the founding donor for our annual uh, symposium uh, series uh, and has been with us since 1996. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, as a principal funder, the Cultural Vision Fund, which provides support not only for the symposium, but a variety of other Stegner Center uh, uh, programs, including uh, the Young Scholar Program, our Green Bag Series, and our Lecture series. Uh, this year's symposium is sponsored by uh, the SJ and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, the Nature Conservancy in Utah, and the Student Natural Resources Law Forum here at the College of Law. A few quick announcements about logistics uh, before we get underway today. The King's English uh, Bookshop has joined us again this year as our symposium bookseller and has many of our speakers' books and other books of interest for sale. Uh, please visit uh, the bookshop site that's located uh, in the left sidebar on the symposium homepage in uh, WOVA. I'd also like to note uh, that uh, uh, in response to some queries that we've received, uh, that we're uh, recording the sessions for the symposium. And it's our intention, uh, once we have speaker assent, uh, to share uh, those recordings uh, with uh, you, uh, our attendees. Uh, also, uh, we'll be adding uh, web links and other material uh, uh, in uh, WOVA for uh, this year's uh, symposium. Uh, information about CLE credit uh, for uh, the lawyers in the crowd is located in the left sidebar on uh, the WOVA symposium homepage. An online evaluation uh, form is located under the survey tab in the left sidebar of the symposium event homepage in WOVA. Uh, we would greatly appreciate it uh, if you could take the time uh, to fill out the symposium evaluation form. <laughs> Not only are the evaluations helpful to us uh, in our planning for next year's and future symposia, but also uh, important uh, to our donors. Uh, so we very much appreciate your feedback. Uh, to ask questions uh, of our speakers, uh, please type your question in the Q&A uh, window uh, by clicking uh, that button at, in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you like a question that another attendee has asked, uh, please click the thumbs up icon to like that question. Uh, questions that are liked by multiple participants <clears throat> will rise to the top of the list uh, to be asked in the time available at the conclusion <clears throat> of the presentation. Uh, I also uh, should note, uh, as uh, those of you with us yesterday know, that uh, most of our speakers' presentations have been pre-recorded in the interest of time and planning, uh, but uh, our speakers, uh, including our speaker this morning, uh, are all uh, with us live uh, and will be available to uh, join us live at the conclusion of the recording for the question and answer uh, session. Uh, with that, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, this year's uh, Wallace Stegner Lecture, Overcoming Consumerism for a Better You and a Better Planet. Uh, 
Uh, our speaker uh, this year delivering this uh, lecture uh, is Joshua Becker. Uh, he is the Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author of four books. He's the founder and editor of Becoming Minimalist, a website read by over 100 million readers each month. He's also the publisher of Simplify Magazine and Simple Money Magazine and founder of The Hope Effect, a nonprofit organization changing how the world cares for orphans. Uh, currently, uh, he lives in Peoria, Arizona with his wife and his two uh, teenage children. Uh, we're very pleased to have Joshua with us uh, this morning. Uh, and with that, uh, we'll turn to his presentation and then uh, proceed with uh, the Q&A session uh, at the conclusion of that presentation. Thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me and inviting me to your important work in the symposium here. I am excited and thrilled and honored uh, to get to be a part of it and to add my story, to add my passion, to add my life's work um, to what you guys are doing. I come with a pretty simple message today uh, to start us off for day number two. And the simple message that I want to bring is this, that there is more joy to be found in owning less than we can ever find pursuing more. There is more joy to be found in owning less than we can ever find pursuing and accumulating more. Unfortunately, we live in a um, hyper-consumeristic society. Uh, we live in a culture, we live in a country, in a society that glamorizes consumption over and over and over again. In fact, statistically speaking, we see 5,000 advertisements every single day, all convincing us to buy something else. Uh, actually, I've seen some studies that put that number up to 10,000 ads per day, but I take the safer number of 5,000 ads. And when you think about every advertisement, every marketing message, every single one of them seeks to convince us that we are not as happy as we could be unless we buy whatever they're selling. And so it doesn't matter what the object of their marketing message is. It could be new jeans. It could be a new camera. It could be a new car. It could be a specific vacation. Uh, it could be uh, a new watch. It could be a new perfume, chips, soda, whatever it is. Every marketing message tells us at its core that our life is not as good, it's not as happy, it's not as convenient, it's not as luxurious, it's not as comfortable. Our life will be better if we buy whatever they're selling. And what I think happens is we see so many messages, so many times from people who are so good at it, one million by the time we reach the age of 21, that we very subtly begin to believe it. And so if you were to ask any person, are you looking for happiness in consumption? Are you looking for happiness in consumerism? Do you think the things you buy are gonna make you happy? Nobody would say yes to that, but we all start living like it's true. And so most people, in society, most of us spend our lives constantly chasing consumeristic pursuits. We want a bigger house. We want a nicer car. We want trendier fashion. We want the newest technology. We want the coolest toys for our kids. We want more and more and more. And so we accumulate more and more and more thinking it's going to improve our lives, but it doesn't. And so I think when someone comes along with, again, a pretty simple message that there is actually more joy to be found in owning less than we can ever find pursuing more, it tends to resonate in our heart and it rings true in our soul. 
And we tend to understand yet again where we find real meaning and real significance in life. So that's what I want to talk about today to set the table uh, for day number two. I'm going to focus a little less specifically on plastics and just more on this idea of consumerism and consumption and how when we begin to see the false promises of it and when we begin to choose a life of owning less and pursuing greater intentionality with our money and our time and our energy, that it ends up with a better life, it ends up with a better planet, and it ends up with a better contribution to all of the world and society around us. So uh, that's where we're headed today. Uh, what I would like to do is I want to share my story, uh, a little bit about how I discovered this, uh, how, I've, uh, how I've become so passionate about it, uh, some of the benefits of owning less and some of the, the drawbacks of excessive consumerism and consumption. Uh, and then uh, I'll have, leave plenty of time for questions at the end and uh, happy to talk about anything that you uh, would like to talk about that would be helpful. I'm, uh, I'm here for you. But uh, let me start by sharing my story because um, I didn't, um, those of you who've read the bio know that I'm the founder of a website called Becoming Minimalist. And my passion now is helping people own less and live more. Uh, but I didn't grow up this way. Uh, in fact, I grew up pretty squarely in the middle class. Um, living the pretty typical middle-class lifestyle, accumulating more and more and, and gaining more and more until my life uh, was radically changed. So let me, uh, let me tell that story uh, first and foremost. They say that the greatest seed of change in our lives is discontent. Uh, the discontent is the greatest seed of change in our lives. And for most of my life, I've had two streams of discontent uh, that have been flowing through my life. Uh, number one, I've always been a little discontent with my finances, which if we were in a room full of people, I would make you raise your hand and say, how many of you are discontent with your finances? And most people's hands uh, go up. In fact, um, pre-COVID, uh, one study said that 78% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck uh, to paycheck. In fact, uh, one in four Americans making over $150,000 a year uh, still live paycheck to paycheck to paycheck. And so um, I was not alone, but that was my lifestyle uh, for most of my life. Despite the fact, um, interestingly enough, that I've been married for 20 years now, and uh, my wife and I had three pretty significant pay increases uh, that I can think of during our first uh, decade of being married. And with each pay increase, I thought we would be able to finally get ahead financially, but we never were. Like more money came in and just more money came out. And so I was always a little discontent. It seemed like I should be able to get ahead financially. It seems like I was making enough that I should be able to get ahead, but I never was quite able to do so. And so something wasn't jiving and I couldn't figure out what it was. The second stream of discontent that was flowing through my life, uh, I have begun to describe as this. I was growing discontent over the focus of my life's energy, which I never would have been able to articulate had it not been for a Saturday morning 12 years ago. Uh, I was living in Vermont and we had had this long winter, just like every winter in Vermont. And we had this short spring, which is more of a mud season. And finally, we were reaching Memorial Day weekend. And it was going to be this beautiful three-day weekend. The sun was going to be shining and spring was here and summer was here. And um, so my wife and I woke up on that three-day weekend. We woke up on Saturday to do uh, what most Americans do on Saturdays. We were going to clean the house, uh, clean the house, uh, run some errands, do some shopping, Actually, we were going to do our spring cleaning finally for the year. Um, I was going to have to work on the Sunday. And then Monday, we were finally going to be able to enjoy the holiday weekend with our, uh, with our two kids. So 
We get up on Saturday. Uh, we both um, decide that we're going to do the spring cleaning. I offer to clean the garage. Um, it was going to be a nice day. My son Salem was five years old, and I thought this would be the year that he would finally enjoy spending time with his father cleaning the garage, which I don't know. I don't know why I thought that such a dad thing to think I get, but uh, anyway, so I get up early on Saturday. Uh, both my wife and I get up early for the projects. I wake my son up. Uh, we go downstairs. I fix him this nice breakfast. And then we go out to the garage and I'm, I'm like, Salem, look at our, look at our project today. How fun is this going to be? And everything was dirty and muddy from the winter and the shelves were just shoveled and disorganized. And I'm like, okay, Salem, I think our best bet is let's just pull everything out of the garage and then we'll hose everything down. We'll return everything in this nice organized fashion. And then it'll be all set for the summer and the fall until the next winter. So I said, Salem, there was a little blue plastic bin kind of on the ground against one of the walls. And I said, Salem, why don't you go grab that bin and pull it out into the driveway? I want him to see what I was talking about. Well, this ends up being, I don't know, one of my biggest mistakes of the day because he looks in the blue plastic bin and here were all of his summer toys. Uh, like everything that he hadn't seen for the nine month long Vermont winter, there was a football and there was plastic golf clubs and a wiffle ball bat and a soccer ball and a Frisbee and like everything he hadn't seen for months and months. And of course, the last thing he wanted to do when he saw his toys was help me anymore with the garage. And so I remember him coming up to me with his ball and his bat. And he's like, hey, dad, uh, can I go play with these in the backyard? I'm like, oh man, I thought we were going to work together and have this bonding time and you're going to learn about responsibility. Um, yes, you can go in the backyard and you can play. Um, you can play with your wiffle ball. Well, he's uh, running off to the backyard, but before he does, he stops before he rounds the corner and he comes back and he says, dad, will you come pitch to me? And, um, and I said, no, Salem, I'm, I'm not going to pitch to you. I'm, I'm cleaning the garage. Remember, this is what we're doing today. We're cleaning the garage. Let me work in the garage. As soon as I'm done, I'll come in the backyard and we'll play catch as long as you want. So he runs in the backyard. I start working on the garage. Uh, I'm pulling things out, but one project leads to another, which leads to another. And hours later, I'm still working on the same garage. Now, my son's running up about every 20 minutes to see if I'm done, if I'm about ready to come play catch. And I just keep pushing him off like one more minute, one more minute. Let me let me finish what I'm doing here and then I'll come play. So this is happening in my driveway and in my garage. My next door neighbor, uh, her name is June. Uh, she's 80 years old and she's out doing all of her yard work, which has now become a bucket list item for me that my uh, wife will do the yard work into her 80s. Anyway, she's pulling weeds and raking leaves and trimming the hedges and She's working hours and hours on her yard. I'm working hours and hours on the garage. I think she's noticing my son running back and forth uh, to see if I'm done. And at, at one point, we happen to walk past each other, June and I, happen to walk past each other on the, the boundary line. And, uh, and she says to me, uh, very sarcastically, I think she notices my frustration. And of course, she's been working all day. And she goes, the joys of home ownership, huh, Joshua? And I said, well, you know what they say, the more stuff you own, the more your stuff owns you, which I don't know, I had read on a cat poster somewhere or something, never really dawned on me what, what it actually meant. And she responds with an absolutely life-changing sentence. She says to me, yeah, you know, Joshua, that's why my daughter is a minimalist. She keeps telling me I don't need to own all this stuff. And I, 
I stood speechless for a moment. I had never heard the word minimalist. But more than that, I, I was almost trying to figure out if this was the first time someone had told me that I didn't have to try to own everything in the world. And I, I remember looking uh, over at my driveway, <clears throat> if you can picture it. Here's this pile of dirty, dusty things that I just pulled out of this dirty, dusty garage. And they were in this big pile in the garage. And I would have said, again, just like everyone, like I would have said, I'm not looking for happiness in my possessions. My things aren't making me happy, obviously. I would have said that. But I'm looking at the pile of stuff in my driveway. <clears throat> and out of the corner of my eye, I see my five-year-old son and he is swinging alone on the swing set in the backyard. And suddenly I had this further realization that not only were my possessions not making me happy, not only was everything I had bought and purchased and accumulated and consumed, everything I had acquired, not only was it not making me happy, Everything I bought was actually taking me away from the very thing that did bring me happiness in life. And not just happiness, but the very thing that brought me joy and brought me meaning and purpose and fulfillment and satisfaction in life. And this is a very different realization. Like it is one thing to say that our things aren't making us happy, but it's something very different when we realize that consumerism isn't just not making us happy. Consumerism is actually distracting us from the very things that do bring us happiness in life. And purpose and meaning significance. Man, there are fascinating statistics about Americans and happiness. Did you know that less than one out of every three Americans say that they are very happy with their lives? Like it doesn't matter how much consumerism ramps up. It doesn't matter how much happiness we are offered in advertisements and in the next purchase and in the next thing that we're going to buy, it never delivers on its promise. And the moment we realize that consumerism isn't fulfilling our deepest needs, but that consumerism is actually taking us away from the things that do fulfill our needs, is the moment we start to overcome consumerism in our personal lives, and we begin to change the effects that it's having on the globe everywhere we look. <clears throat> I thank June uh, for this super short conversation. It's like three sentences long, <laughs> literally. I thanked her for the conversation. <clears throat> Pardon me. I ran inside and uh, I found my wife and she was scrubbing one of the bathrooms or something. And I, I said, Kim, you'll never guess what June just said. She said, we don't have to own this stuff anymore. <coughs> I'm going to take a short break here on the video. <coughs> I'll have you cut this out. <clears throat> I'm glad you're able to do that. <clears throat> All right, let me back up. <clears throat> okay. I thank June for the conversation. Uh, anyway, that's where I'm going to pick up. So I have to scroll back a little bit. I, uh, I thank June for the conversation. Uh, and I went inside and I found my wife, Kim. She was cleaning one of the bathrooms as she was cleaning the inside of the house. And I said, Kim, you'll never guess what June just said. She said, we don't have to own all this stuff anymore. And uh, I don't know, she'd been, my wife had been cleaning the inside of the house for hours and hours. And my two-year-old daughter was pulling at her pant leg. And 
She's like, you know what? That sounds pretty good right about now. I said, I know, doesn't it sound amazing? And so I ran to the computer as we're prone to do these days. And I, I typed in and I said, what is minimalism? And up pops minimalist art and minimalist music and minimalist architecture. And I'm like, no, I'm not so much interested in that. Although it was a very similar idea. And I, I changed my search and I said, what is a minimalist lifestyle? And up pops this whole world to me of people all around the globe who have decided that they are going to own only the things they need to own. And they're going to get rid of everything else. And I, at first I'm thinking to myself, like, what? Like, what a crazy idea. Like, who, like, who does this? Who decides that they own only the things they need to own and they don't buy or accumulate anything above their actual needs? Like, people are doing this? How crazy. Well, I start reading about them and it's, it's very interesting because I, uh, I begin getting introduced to some of their stories. And so I read about a guy named Colin. Uh, Colin Wright was in his 20s. Uh, everything Colin owned fit in a backpack and a duffel bag. And Colin moved around the world. He moved to a new country every four months. Uh, as a matter of fact, the readers of his website voted as to which country he would move to next. And he's talking about minimalism and owning just what he needs and how it allows him to move and get up and go. And I'm like, I can see it. Like, I can see how everything you own fitting in a couple bags would allow you to move every four months. Um, I just remember thinking, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of like my country, kind of like my town. I like my neighborhood. I like my friends. I like the school that my kids go to. I can see how minimalism would allow you to do that and pursue your passion in that way. But that's not quite what I'm looking for. I read about a guy named Dave Bruno. Um, he worked at a university in San Diego. Uh, Dave Bruno took on what he called the 100 thing challenge, uh, where he decided that he was going to own just 100 things, just 100 items. And so he literally had a spreadsheet and he numbered it one to 100 and he listed every single item that he owned. And uh, he got to 100 items and he got rid of everything else by his birthday. Wrote a book about it. Newsweek did an article on him. And again, I'm reading it. And Dave's talking about how much he learned through this process and how self-reflective it was. And I'm like, yeah, I, can, I get it. Like, I can see how you would learn a lot about yourself through that process. And like, I'm into minimalism. I want to own less stuff, but... I don't know. I don't think I want a spreadsheet with everything I own listed on it. That almost sounds like more work than cleaning out my garage. I read about a, another couple, uh, Logan and Tammy Strobel. Uh, they lived up in Portland uh, and they had just a, a ton of debt, um, tons, six figures in debt, if I recall. And they, they were just tired of it. And so they were going to make some changes. And so what they did was they sold their home and they moved into a 200 square foot tiny home on wheels. And they own just 100 things between them, like two forks and two cups and two plates and one cat. And they, uh, they were talking about how quickly they got out of debt. Uh, how freeing it was, how grateful they were for the life change and how they were able to, to live with less stress and less burden. And I'm like, I get it. Like, I, I, I can see it. I can see how moving into a 200 square foot home and just owning two forks would allow you to get out of debt really quickly. But <clears throat> I'm a family of four. I, I probably need more than two forks. <laughs> I probably need more in two cups and um, more than that, uh, we were pretty involved in our community. Uh, I, I was uh, working at a church at the time. And so I was doing a lot of premarital counseling. We would have uh, people over for dinner. Uh, I had a different, a uh, couple different small groups that were meeting in my living room. And 
loved being hospitable and spending time with the neighbors. And I, <clears throat> I just started thinking to myself, if I want to keep doing what's important to me, uh, even four plates isn't going to be enough. <clears throat> I said, how about, how about eight plates? How about eight forks? How about eight cups? My dining room table can seat eight. And a couple of things that I learned uh, pretty early on. Number one, the minimalism always looks different from one person to another based on any number of factors, your family, your occupation, where you live, your hobbies, like all this stuff is going to change the specific items that you're going to own. But the second thing I learned is this, is that minimalism is essentially about values and goals and passions and pursuits. That your values are always going to determine how minimalism looks in your life. I want to stay involved in my community. I liked my friends. I liked my relationships. I liked my kids' school. I wasn't going to get up and move to a new country, but I could still apply minimalism to the place that I was living and what was important to me. This actually became uh, my definition of minimalism. Minimalism is the intentional promotion of the things I most value by removing anything that distracts me from it. Minimalism is about promoting my values and my passions by removing distractions. Specifically in this context, by removing the distraction of consumerism and overcoming the empty promises of it, I can focus more of my life on those pursuits and values that provide real meaning and real happiness and significance. <clears throat> With that as the definition, uh, my wife and I began going through our home and we got rid of 60 to 70% of our possessions. Never missed a single one of them. Uh, it took us about nine months to get through our entire home. Three years later, we actually did move into a smaller home when we moved states uh, for a new job. <clears throat> And so we got even downsized even more at that point, <clears throat> but really have never missed anything that we've gotten rid of and have been entirely thankful for the decision that we made. <clears throat> Going back to that Saturday, uh, I remember calling my mom and uh, I told my mom about my conversation with June and I said, we've decided to become minimalist. And uh, my mom said, oh, Joshua, I would... Um, I, I, I believe she said, I was just watching Oprah and she was interviewing some minimalists. Did you know that they don't go to the grocery store, but they get all their food out of dumpsters? And uh, I said, no, I, I didn't read that. <clears throat> any, didn't read that in any of the literature. June forgot to tell me that um, <laughs> I, um, I've since come to know that there are people and, and, and their hobby or passion, whatever it is, that uh, they they don't. Um, their goal is to not spend any money on food, and so they do a lot of farming and um, <clears throat> sometimes get food out of dumpsters. But I can see why maybe uh, my mom would confuse freegans is the term for this <clears throat> with minimalists, but uh, a little bit different. But um, all that to say, based on that conversation. I started a website uh, called Becoming Minimalist. It was a decision that we had made. It was the, the process that we were about to undertake. And so I, I just wanted to have an online journal, a, a diary, a, a blog of what we were keeping, what we were getting rid of, the lessons we were learning. I wanted my mom to know that we are still buying FDA approved produce. I don't know if it means anything for, for the grandkids. And so um, we started this blog and this was 12 years ago. I think the first month, uh, me and my mom were the only ones reading uh, the website. But today, uh, over one and a half million people every single month come to becomingminimalist.com. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm here today speaking with you. 
Uh, I've been all around the country. I've spoken in Iceland and Poland and Brazil and <clears throat> Mexico and Canada and Sweden. And this is a message that um, this is a message that the world needs. Uh, but this is a message that people are drawn to. Uh, we have reached, uh, a, 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 as as someone once called it, this level of um, peak stuff in the world uh, where we own more stuff than we've ever owned before in the history of humankind. And when someone comes along with the message that reminds us that there is no joy to be found in consumerism, that most people are drawn to it. They see the merits of owning less and more and more and more people are flocking to the message of owning less and living more. And so I think it's an important conversation. Um, one of the things that I started doing on the blog is whenever I noticed a benefit of minimalism is what I called it. Whenever I noticed how my life was improving because I owned less stuff, I would make a little article entry and I would say, you know what I just noticed? My life is improving in this way or that way. And in the end, I ended with 21, I call them the 21 life-giving benefits of minimalism. And what I find is, um, I love having this conversation with people because we live in this world where we're constantly told to buy more and that our life will improve if we consume more. And very rarely do we take a step back and ask the question, yeah, but what if I purposefully owned less? What if I intentionally owned less stuff? In what ways would my life improve? I'm going to give you just, uh, I think we even have a little chat window open here. Uh, and I'm going to give you, uh, this will seem like an eternity probably on a Zoom meeting, but uh, let me give you just about 45 seconds. And in the chat box, I want you to answer this question. If I were to own less stuff, in what practical ways would my life improve? What would be at least one benefit of owning less in my life? Go ahead. I'm just going to give you, like I said, 30, 45 seconds. Uh, go ahead and enter it in, and then I'll, I'll run through some of my list, and uh, certainly we'll uh, crisscross on some of the things that I have and that you mentioned as well. Yeah, keep going. Uh, it's um, it's an interesting question that I've uh, I've never seen people struggle to answer. Uh, I, I I used to say that I've never asked this question to an empty room. Like sometimes I'll break them into groups of three or four or just have them raise their hand. And no one struggles with how would my life improve if I owned less? Uh, usually we can start rattling off the list pretty quickly. And the more we think about it, the more benefits come to mind. Uh, let me give you uh, just a few. <clears throat> uh, no doubt um, less cleaning, uh, someone said. Uh, less cleaning. Uh, I love having a clean house, but I hate having to clean. Uh, and so I find that owning less stuff allows that to happen. Um, actually, when you think about it, uh, not just less cleaning, but if we own less stuff, um, we would have less to clean, less to organize and manage and maintain, repair, replace, recycle, uh, dispose of, whatever it might be. Um, or how about even how much time do we spend working just so we can make more money, so we can do more shopping, so we can buy more stuff to bring home that we have to clean and organize and manage and maintain and repair for the rest of our lives. It's, it's pretty unbelievable how much time we waste accumulating, maintaining stuff and things that we don't need. So more time, uh, less cleaning. Number two, more money. Certainly someone said more money, which might look different for anybody. For some of you, that means we're able to stop living paycheck to paycheck because I'm spending less, I'm buying less, I'm, I'm taking care of less. So I'm able to get uh, out from living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, I'm able to overcome some of the financial stress in my life. 
Uh, I'm able to get ahead financially. I'm able to become more generous. If I want to, maybe I'm able to work less or retire earlier. More money means anything to uh, any number of people. <clears throat> Owning less stuff means I have less stress in my life. Uh, Randy Elkhorn says it this way. Uh, every increased possession adds increased anxiety onto our lives. And it is so true. Every physical possession we own takes up physical space in our home, but it also takes up mental space in our mind. Everything we own takes up space and it has to be dealt with. And we know that it has to be dealt with. We know that someone has to go through our basement, our attic, our garage, the kitchen cabinets, the coat closet, the, under the bed. Like eventually somebody has to deal with all this stuff. The average American home, uh, according to the LA Times, contains 300,000 items inside of it. The New York Times recently referred to the American generation as the most hurried, stressed, busy, tired generation of all time. No doubt, the fact that we are all trying to manage more stuff than at any point in human history is contributing to the stress and anxiety and busyness and hurried lives that we're living. There's a better way. Own less stuff. More money, more time, less stress, fewer distractions in life. Uh, we're able to have fewer decisions. Uh, Barry Schwartz um, talks about the, the paradox of choice uh, in his book and his TED Talk, which is fabulous. And he makes this point that a, a little bit of choice is good, but more choice than is needed actually begins to detract from happiness. Um, this whole idea of decision fatigue and the more decisions that we have to make in a day means that our decisions become less and less wise over the course of the day. And so there's this growing movement of people who have decided that they're going to capsule wardrobe and wear just the same things that they need to every single day or repeat their meals every single day and just eliminate choices and eliminate decisions so they can focus their minds on more important things. Uh, more freedom from the past, I wrote down. Um, we're able to focus more on experiences. Um, more space. Um, the average American home has tripled in size in the last 50 years, and still 10% of Americans rent off-site storage. And 24% of Americans can't even park their cars in their garage. Like we don't have a space problem in America. We just keep trying to put too much stuff inside the spaces that we have. Our homes are plenty big. Our homes are bigger than they need to be. If we would just stop putting so much stuff inside of them, the average American home now has more televisions than people inside of it. American homes keep getting bigger and family sizes keep getting smaller. We don't need more space. Uh, we need less stuff. Uh, I discovered as I started owning less stuff uh, that I had more intentionality in my life, um, that this process of removing distractions to focus on the things that matter most. Um, it started with physical possessions, but it began. I began looking at the way I spend my time began looking at my relationships, began looking at my habits, and began applying this principle of removing distractions to focus on the things that bring real meaning into my life. But it all started with physical possessions. Intentionality in one area of life begins to bring intentionality in other areas as well. As I started owning less stuff, I became a better example for my kids that I constantly hear from parents, how do I get my kids to stop wanting more and more stuff and wanting things that they don't need and constantly wanting more toys? And I always respond, like, the way you help your kids to stop wanting things they don't need is you stop buying things that you don't need. 
Like our kids are just looking it up, looking at us as parents and they're seeing kitchens full of things and drawers that don't close and garages we can't park in and boxes full of stuff in the basement and the attic and closets jam packed full of things. And they're thinking, my parents keep buying stuff they don't need. Apparently that's what you're supposed to do. And so as we overcame consumerism, we became a better example for our kids that they can focus on more important pursuits than consumerism. Obviously, this is a life that's better for the environment on a global scale. Uh, I found that as I began owning fewer things, I was able to own higher quality things. Uh, in fact, when I was in Sweden, I was speaking to a, a large group of industry leaders uh, across uh, the European Union. And the conversation was, as minimalism grows, how will this affect business going forward. And I said, look, as people become more drawn to this idea of owning less, they are going to buy higher quality items. They're going to want things that last longer. They're going to want items that can be used for more than one purpose. Being minimalist doesn't mean being cheap. It doesn't mean buying the, the, the most cheaply made thing. It means buying something that's made to last, the tire quality. Uh, from anything, from the pants that I wear, to the shirts that I wear, to the watch that I wear, to the technology that I buy, like I'm always looking for not what is the cheapest thing, but if I don't need 20 pairs of pants in my closet, I can just have three or four pairs that I really like, that are well-made, that are gonna last. Uh, as I began owning less stuff, I began comparing myself less with other people. Uh, how much of our comparison game is just about physical possessions and what people own. I uh, began to overcome that. Uh, less work for someone else. Uh, I found more contentment in my life. I found more gratitude in my life. I found more generosity in my life. Like how many of us want to be generous people? We all want to be generous people. Uh, if you ask a room full of people, I, like 99.9% .9 of hands go up. Yeah, I want to be a generous person. We just can't seem to find the margin or the space to do so. Meanwhile, we got more stuff at home, collecting dust on the shelves than we know what to do with. Like we have space and we have margin and we have capacity to be generous people but we need to overcome consumerism to fully walk in that desire and in that role in the world. Uh, better understanding of myself. Man, this process isn't, uh, isn't easy. Uh, it's, it can be difficult. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I had to wrestle with why did I buy things that I don't need? Uh, I had to wrestle with why is this hard for me to get rid of? Uh, what are my passions in life? What, what is the role that I want to play in the world? What is the difference that I want to make in the world? And what do I need to own in order to do that? And then what's everything that is distracting us from it? Like These aren't easy questions, but they're always valuable and they're always worth walking down. And I don't think I would have ever wrestled with those to the degree that I did until I really started to ask myself, what do I need to have to live my best life? What do I need to own? And what are just all the lies that I've been told over and over and over again? Here's what I found, and I'll close with this. As I overcame consumerism, as I desired and began owning less stuff, I found that I had more money, I had more time, I had more focus, I had more intentionality, I had less stress, I had more of my life to pursue things that matter in the long run, things that bring me real purpose and meaning and passion in life. And that is going to change for every single person here. How you define what am I most passionate about in life is going to be different than how I'm going to define it. But the way you devote more of your life towards it is by owning less stuff and by overcoming the empty promises of consumerism. And in so doing, you will be reminded that your life 
is too valuable to waste chasing and pursuing material possessions. That overcoming consumerism means you live a better life and the planet looks better for everyone else going forward. We need you to live your best life in the world. And the way you do that is by overcoming consumerism once and for all and living for things that actually matter. I'm happy to answer any questions about um, the minimalism movement worldwide, um, some of the steps, specific steps that we took to get there, some of the things that I've learned, some of the things I've noticed. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions that you guys might have. So thanks so much. Uh, we've, uh, we do have some questions. We do have some time. Uh, my intention, uh, so everyone is aware, uh, we're scheduled to end at 930 uh, with a 15 minute break. Uh, we'll end by 935, no later than that. Uh, and that will provide a break and we'll stay on time with the remainder of the uh, program for today. Um, so uh, the subject of the symposium this year, uh, as uh, everyone knows, is a uh, uh, the plastics paradox. And so the first question actually ties back in that with minimalism. Uh, and that is, how do you avoid using plastic uh, as a minimalist? Uh, and then goes on, I'm thinking of uh, shampoo, dishwashing detergent, food packaging, etc. I think a question is, how does the concern about uh, plastic consumption fit with the uh, minimalist lifestyle? Yeah, sure. And I'll, um, I'll, I'll probably leave the you know, specifics up to, up to you guys to uh, apply it to your uh, unique situation and, and your unique life. Um, but what we've discovered now, there are, uh, there are many people who are, um, uh, who are, who are very passionate about how do I, how do we do this? Um, uh, and how, how do I avoid any waste? I think of uh, Bew Johnson at zero waste home and, uh, and she'll have, you know, much more of the very specific, tools and tricks and things that, that they do to avoid all waste, uh, or at least a, 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 to a, a very minimal amount. Um, but as, as I'm owning fewer things, uh, I am, I think, less swayed by new products or new things that need to be tried, if that makes sense. And so, like, we have the cleaning solutions that we, that we like to use. And so I, I don't need to, it seems like all those things that you've pointed out, the shampoo and the dishwasher and, and the detergent that, that every new, I don't know, every new couple of months, they've come out with a new improved thing that, that you need to try. And all they've done is change the packaging and maybe changed a little bit in there. Uh, but we become very stable in this is the shampoo that we like. This is the dishwashing uh, thing that we like to use. And as, as we find um, ways to to get that that doesn't require the the use of plastic, I'm I'm just less tempted to um, to try out new things all the time because I'm I'm content with what we have and, and what we found. And I I remember even with cleaning um, detergents uh, when we got to the 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 sink under the under the the kitchen the cabinet under the kitchen sink and opened it up and there were just bottles and bottles of, of cleaning liquids. And I didn't even know which ones we liked or which ones we used. We just like kept buying new ones. And so like we went through them and we said, this one works well and this one doesn't work well. And we could clean most of our things with this, with this one type of cleaning solution. And so um, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of tie in, uh, a lot of tie into it. So the next question is, uh, it takes us back to the uh, story uh, that you uh, started with, um, cleaning out the garage uh, in the spring there in Vermont. Uh, uh, after uh, you saw your son uh, in the backyard, did you go out and play with him uh, after looking <laughs> at the pile of uh, stuff in the driveway? I, uh, I, my memories from that day... Um, my memories from that day include going in to talk to my wife, uh, running to the computer, uh, deciding that we were going to do this. Uh, all my stuff was still piled up. In my, well, the short answer is I, I don't recall going out in the backyard that day, um, running out and the, all the stuff was in the driveway and starting to sort out what we were going to get rid of. I remember 
pulling my car back into the garage and noticing all the stuff in my car that didn't need to be there. But probably my, uh, my most significant memory, so this was Memorial Day weekend, uh, a year later, uh, Memorial Day came and uh, my son was learning how to ride his bicycle. And so uh, it was the first day that we went for a bike ride, me and him, um, around the block on his own. He had, he had learned how to do it. And I, I went back to the blog and I was going to try to write something, a journal entry from the day. And it occurred to me that one year later, uh, after spending that entire weekend uh, cleaning out the house, that I was freed up from having to do that. And so I, I got to spend... I uh, got to spend that next year uh, Memorial Day weekend with him. So I would say uh, on that specific day, I, I don't recall, but I, I know over the course of the last 12 years, uh, I've been able to spend way more time with him, uh, with my wife, with my daughter, uh, even pursuing work that matters uh, because of because of minimalism. Yeah, I think that really brings home the uh, benefits of uh, this sort of an approach. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, another question, uh, uh, this one reads, uh, sometimes more is less, uh, and then goes on, uh, the purchase of energy sustainability products, uh, like, uh, tankless water heaters or, uh, electric, uh, vehicles, uh, or solar or heat pumps, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, uh requires uh, acquiring things, uh, but also uh, removing uh, old uh, technology. Uh, how does that fit into the minimalist approach? Well, I would say first and foremost, I'll, uh, you know, I'll leave to you guys some of the experts on the, the, the cost benefit analysis of, of um, replacing old equipment with, uh, with newer equipment and, and what the savings are uh, going forward. I, I think generally speaking, uh, the the savings happen um, over time uh, on some of those some of those changes. Uh, minimalism doesn't. I I always uh, push back a little bit when um, I hear someone say, "Well, minimalism means I need to replace things," or uh, "Minimalism means you have to buy a bunch of new things to do it," or "A true minimalist would never." whatever it might be like minimalism gets to be whatever you want it to be. And so as you begin owning less stuff, uh, maybe you begin discovering that replacing some of that, some of the old, less energy efficient um, devices uh, becomes worth making the change, but not necessarily, but if you don't, then you don't have to, you don't have to change it. Uh, I don't think a minimalist, if you become a minimalist, it doesn't mean you have to start driving an electric car. Um, maybe you will, and maybe that's something that you want to do, and that's how you want to apply it in your life. But, um, but on the on the surface, um, I don't think minimalism means all those things have to be replaced uh, in your pursuit of it. Maybe you find other reasons to do it um, personally or financially or environmentally. But that would be uh, that would be up to you, and that would be your call. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, a couple of questions that uh, speak to, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, how do you uh, conceptualize uh, the minimalist lifestyle in terms of the larger society and the economy uh, that's based uh, so much <clears throat> on uh, consumption? Uh, and particularly when, uh, you know, so many people's jobs involve uh, selling stuff. Yeah. Uh, so how does this play out in the larger uh uh, societal setting. Yeah. Um, uh, I, yeah. My hope is that everyone, uh, everyone embraces it. <clears throat> uh, first off, uh, becoming minimalist doesn't mean that you stop spending money. Um, it does mean that you change what you spend your money on. Um, and so if I'm not buying a bigger screen television, if I'm not buying more and more clothes to put in my closet, that doesn't mean that I'm not still spending that money. Uh, it could mean that I'm I'm using it to go out for a nice meal with my family, or I'm I'm taking a short trip with my family, or uh, we started a nonprofit organization called the Hope Effect, and so that's where some of my money went to. And so, becoming minimalist doesn't mean that that money stops changing hands. Uh, it just means that that what we're buying and what we're spending it on does change. And so, if everyone became minimalist overnight. 
then yeah, there's going to be a, a lot of economic upheaval and a lot of adjustments that need to take place. But as it slowly becomes more and more popular, I think the industry begins to change. Industry begins to change, and new opportunities arise. And so, uh, I'll just close with this: when I was um, when I was asked to speak in Sweden, it was to a group of business leaders uh, on behalf of a Camino magazine, where they uh, every year they had this annual meeting where they would talk about growing movements in consumerism and consumption and environment and environmentalism. And um, the the business leaders would come and they would ask questions. So as this begins to grow and people begin moving in this direction, what does that mean for our industry and for our companies? And so they were asking me about minimalism. And I said, well, one of the things that it means is people are going to be looking for higher quality products that last longer. They're going to be looking for um, multi-use tools rather than single use items. Um, And so business will survive. Economics will survive. Money will continue to change hands. Just the the thing that's that's being bought and sold, uh, I think, is going to differ. And so maybe you find a growth in the the service economy uh, um, experiences those uh, those types of things. So, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm not naive enough to to think that there isn't some economic um, changing that needs to take place. But uh, I think that the people will adjust and people will change, and uh, and and smart leaders will uh, will discover. Uh, how people want to spend their money on rather than uh, buying a bunch of plastic stuff they don't need. Well, uh, with that, uh, let me uh, let me uh, thank you uh, very much, Joshua, for uh, uh, being uh, so adaptable this morning. Yeah. Uh, and apologies again to the audience for the technical difficulty that we had. Uh, we got through most uh, of the questions. There's a couple of questions really that are sort of messages about how to deliver the minimalist uh, message. Uh, I'd encourage the audience to take a look at those. Uh, Again, apologies, we couldn't get through all of the questions, uh, but I think we hit the highlights. Uh, With that, um, we will uh, take uh, uh, just about a 10 minute break. Uh, We will reconvene at the uh, uh, 9.45 to move into the first uh, panel uh, addressing the question of solutions. Uh, Thank you again for joining us. And uh, on behalf of everyone, Joshua, Uh, Very pleased uh, to have you with us and with your presentation. Uh, Very enlightening. Thank you very much.